Hello my friends and welcome back to episode 1 of the Talking Debate Show where, as you can tell from the title, is a brand new show where each week me and my three lovely co-hosts along with um, future guests will be discussing some really interesting debates around throughout Tolkien's entire work so not just limited to the Lord of the Rings on Prime show but throughout Tolkien's entire legendarium so yeah, I think just something different as well so i wanted to try this out so i hope you guys enjoy this as well but of course in order to do this i would need the help of three lovely people so firstly as you should guys know for a while now from the podcast welcome i'm zobud hi everyone good to have you back on really appreciate it also we have um Lexi from Girl Next Gondor YouTube channel whose links will be in the description and was on for my woman in in the second age um, panel discussion. Welcome again. Hey. Thanks for coming on. And also we have Florian who is um, a new member of the channel and is quite um, prominent on Reddit I believe. So I'll leave links to all that as well. Welcome my friend. Hello. Hi. So... As you can tell from the title, we're going to be the main, the first topic and question of today's episode is who was the most impactful villain on Arda? So I haven't gone with the strongest villain or something like that. It's whose actions and the events they were in and what they did themselves left the biggest impact on Middle Earth, on Arda and out of all of Tolkien's works so mainly looking at the effects as well so I hope that will be a quite interesting thing so what's going to happen is each person has a designated character and they're going to explain it and give an argument for each one then at the end there will be a poll and you guys can vote who you think was the best so I think Let's get right into it and firstly we're going to be starting off with the character of Sauron and I think the best person I know who is a Sauron like character is Lexi, I'm joking. So let's get right into it Lexi. Well, um, I, hopefully as I can demonstrate that's a, a bit more of a flattering comparison than people <laughs> might think. Uh, when the world is created. Some of the Einar decide that they want to actually enter into the world and participate in the history that they've create, um, just described. Um, these my, or these Einar are classified into two camps. So we have the Valar, which are the 14, 15 most powerful. Uh, and then they, they have an innumerable host, really, of these uh, helper spirits known as the Maiar. And this is characters like Gandalf and Saruman and probably the Balrog. Um, these all fall under that my R category. So, so Sauron is not an elf. He's not a human. Um, he's not some sort of like fairy demon creature. He's a Maya. Uh, so that's his origins. And in origin, he is good. He is uh, he's a servant of the Vala Aule. So um, he has an affinity for craftsmanship, for physical matter, uh, for the substances of Arda. And we don't know at what point it happened, but it was very early on. Uh, Sauron is corrupted by Melkor or Morgoth. That's who we'll be referring to him as for the rest of the uh, <laughs> for the duration of the debate. Um, Sauron becomes Morgoth's prime lieutenant during the First Age, uh, while Morgoth is off causing trouble in the Blessed Realm. He's in charge of keeping Angband running. Um, he prosecutes war against the elves. He continues to breed the orcs that Morgoth devises. Uh, when the War of the Jewels begins, the great wars of the First Age that are discussed in the Silmarillion and that the heroes of the Lord of the Rings sort of look back on, he does many, many horrible, atrocious things as Morgoth's prime lieutenant. Uh, he's known as the Lord of Werewolves, the Lord of Vampires. Um, he gets, I, I won't go into all of his exploits, but he does uh, end up feeding Galadriel's older brother, Finrod, to the wolves. Uh, he gets in a fight with Luthien and Huon that he uh, doesn't come out of very well. And at the end of the First Age, there's this massive war 
uh, the War of Wrath, in which the rest of the Valar, the good Valar, come and uh, fight Morgoth, basically conquer him forever. Sauron is sort of caught in the in the cleanup there, um, and he's offered a chance to repent of his evil and return to Valinor and um, basically reform his life, and he almost takes it. He's on the verge, uh, but he decides at the last minute he can't do it, and he flees back into Middle-earth. Um, and as the ages pass, the years accrue, he starts to uh, spread his influence among most of the remaining men of Middle-earth at that point. Um, a lot of, you know, Aragorn's descent or ancestors, Boromir's ancestors even, have moved to this new continent island that we know as Numenor, uh, that was sort of newly created at the end of the First Age. So Sauron kind of convinces himself that, you know, the Valar have abandoned Middle-earth, um, there's a bunch of elves running around. <laughs> there's a bunch of elves running around. Um, but they're not doing a very good job, at least in his eyes, of leading the reorganization and the cleanup. So he decides that it is his right and duty to uh, fix this and um, starts to set his sights on world domination. Um, he gets involved with the elves of Eregion. This is where he uh, convinces them to create the Rings of Power. Um, He's persuading them, basically, that they can use this technology, magic, power of the rings to stop the decay of Middle-earth and basically slow the effects of time on it um, and make it into this beautiful world that, or realm that's uh, comparable to the Blessed Realms or to Numenor, even. So he persuades the elves of this. The elves are all on board because they're kind of, you know, like that. They like to believe that they can conquer any any obstacle if only they have enough help and knowledge. Uh, these are Noldor elves. Um, that's kind of their MO. So he convinces them of this. They make the rings. Um, Sauron in secret, of course, makes the one ring, which means that all of the things that they hoped to achieve through the rings are now subject to Sauron's will. Uh, the elves are appalled. Sauron uh, realizes that he has not managed to fool them as well as he thought, and so um, he decides that he's just going to conquer them outright and march against them with open warfare. That does not go super well for him. Um, the elves are kind of tricky to conquer, even though he's built up quite, you know, quite a significant military force of uh, men he's enslaved and orcs that he's sort of purpose-bred for this situation. So for uh, centuries in the Second Age, he's leading little sorties and skirmishes and fighting against the elves. Different battles happen. Um, he'll gain ground and then he'll give it up. And the thorn in his side throughout all of this is the Numenorians. Um, they are basically helping the elves out, making it harder for him to conquer the elves and bring all of Middle-earth under his glorious sway. So he decides, well, I really got to get Numenor now. Um, Numenor is very powerful militarily, so he can't, even he can't openly oppose them. So he does something very clever. He pretends that he surrenders to them, and he offers to go back with them as a captive, a prisoner of war. He does that, and he, um, over the course of like 60 years, so it's very gradual, at least from a human perspective, he works his way into their society. He convinces them that eternal life is theirs for the, the asking, if only they can uh, bring themselves to attack the Blessed Realm. So he persuades them of that. Uh, that doesn't go over too well with the Valar, who crush Numenor into the sea. Sauron has to flee back into Middle-earth. Um, he's a little bit weakened, but he still has the One Ring, so he gradually builds himself back up. The War of the Last Alliance takes place where the survivors of Numenor, Elendil, uh, and the High Elven King Gilgalad, um, make this final push against Sauron. Sauron's making a final push against them. Uh, Gilgalad and Elendil both perish, but of course so does Sauron. Um, and Isildur claims the ring, and so that kicks off the whole Third Age, which people are probably more familiar with, where Sauron is diminished, but growing in power, and um, of course he learns that the ring has been found, the ring has been found by a hobbit, uh, the hobbit brings the ring to the cracks of doom, where through a chance, stroke of luck, providence, divine intervention, it is destroyed, and that of course destroys most of Sauron's efficacious will and spirit. He's basically reduced to nothing or a, a mere ghost or a shadow. He can never take physical form and physically threaten the world again. So, that all being said, why is he the best? Well, <laughs> um, so I said before, Sauron is a Maya, so he's not in origin the most powerful. He's actually in origin the weakest of the characters here. 
but I will contend that he is the most influential. So um, first of all, we have to look at his influence over time. Um, Morgoth, really his his direct influence on Middle-earth is limited to uh, before, before the beginning of history and like up until the end of the first age. And even then at the end of the first age, he's really, he's stuck in his, in his fortress. He doesn't come out much. Sauron is still very much active throughout the first age and then on into the second and the third. And the second age and the third age are much longer in terms of time than the first age was. So we're talking like seven, eight thousand years of direct uh, influence. Plus, you know, even into the fourth age, even after Sauron's been defeated and basically destroyed, um, his influence is still felt. So that's that's a long time span. Um, and again, even in the first age, you know, Morgoth is there, uh, more powerful than Sauron. But Sauron is accomplishing a lot of what Morgoth's projects are. He's kind of the the administrator, if you will. So without Sauron, I think Morgoth is much less influential even. Secondly, you have to look at a geographic span. Uh, again, we talk about Morgoth where he's mostly focused on, he, he does some stuff in Valinor, he destroys the two trees, um, but then he's basically pent up in Beleriand. And Beleriand is destroyed at the end of the First Age. Um, so Sauron has an effect in Beleriand. He destroys Numenor. Uh, his influence is what causes the world to go from being a flat shape to being a round shape. Uh, so that's pretty influential. Um, and of course, he does the whole, all of um, Eriador and the East and those realms that are like just little names and question marks on that big map, the Khand and Harad. So in terms of geographical span, I think, again, Sauron is the winner. <laughs> and um, finally, just in terms of the number of people he affects, um, you know, think about a second age without Sauron. We've got the elves hanging out of, of Eregion. Um, a lot of them Eldar, you know, from Valinor, powerful elves. Um, basically starting on this project of we're going to rebuild and we're going to, you know, take this land that's been ravaged by war and make it something beautiful. And that's their goal. Uh, so Sauron, of course, corrupts that and turns them straight back into fighting, straight back into losing all of their lore masters in battle and um, and anything the elves do achieve, of course, is achieved through the rings, which once Sauron's ring is destroyed, um, this is why, of course, at the end of Lord of the Rings, we see all of the elves leave. There's nothing left for them there. Uh, and I would argue that that's, again, that's, that's due to Sauron. So yeah. that's my, that's my opening, my opening statement. Looks like we have got some interesting things coming up because he have put some really excellent arguments forward. And I think, I think from the main bills, actually, your first part was that if we're talking about impact, duration wise, you could argue that Sauron has been there, maybe not from the beginning beginning like Morgoth, but throughout the entire of Tolkien's Legendarium, maybe you could argue that Sauron's had um, been in the most things and caused the most stuff. So, of course, with your other arguments as well, and looks like you um, went for Morgoth quite a bit as well. So, luckily next we have Florian, who will be um, debating on the side of Morgoth. So, take it away, my friend. Okay, so just a foil a short overview over Morgoth's character and history. So he was originally called uh, Melkor and he was the mightiest of the Ainur. The, that was there were already mentioned the uh, angelic beings created by the one true god Eru. I mean, before the world even existed, he uh, <clears throat> Morgoth kind of developed in a different direction from the other Ainur. He wandered alone and looked at all the empty space where the world would later be and wanted to create things, wanted to fill it. And he really wanted to yeah, to craft things that he could possess. And when it came to creating the world in the great music of the Ainur, uh, Eru, the god, gave all the Ainur a theme basically, like instructions on, on how to make the world, how to shape it. But uh, Morgoth, he didn't really <clears throat> just want to follow orders. He had his own ideas. He wanted yeah, to be basically in control himself. And in, <clears throat> during this music, this creation process brought over some other Ainur to his side. 
Uh, not Sauron yet, yet I believe, but some others like the Balrogs. <clears throat> and uh, ultimately, of course, uh, the world uh, was created as God wanted it because he's all powerful and he told Morgoth that uh, in the end, anything Morgoth would do would basically just uh, yeah, end up being part of God's plan and end, uh, <clears throat> end up enriching the world, but Morgoth didn't really... I'm. It's bit, maybe he repented for a bit, but he still wanted to follow, <clears throat> wanted to follow his own plan. And because there was finally something other than the void, he entered the world and wanted to be its ruler. But the other Ainur followed his brother Manwë, who became king of the world because he was less powerful than Morgoth, but had more insight into the will of God and yeah, basically a more direct connection to God which enabled him to receive his wisdom and instructions. And Morgoth became very angry that the other Ainu wouldn't follow him, even though he clearly had the best plans. And <clears throat> so he destroyed the literal world-building efforts of the other Ainu when they shaped mountains and seas and plains and made forests. And then the, so they eventually got into a conflict and Morgoth was overall when all the other all the other Valar, the mightiest Ainur, came together against him, he was oh well, it's not sure maybe maybe he would have had a chance, but <clears throat> he was afraid to face them, so he fled for a while. But then later on, when they didn't pay attention, he came back and uh, yeah, really really messed up the paradise the Valar had built and that was the point when they fled into the west and built a fortified paradise here, there that he couldn't ruin. So Morgoth ruled Middle-earth for quite a long time, of corrupted a lot of things there, basically tried to bring it under, under his control, plants, he made the misty mountains, tried to corrupt animals into hideous beasts, <coughs> basically trying to make everything subject to him and design everything the others had made, change it up so it <coughs> more or less uh, fulfilled its purposes. And then <coughs> eventually the elves awake and the Valar decide, okay, it's our job to protect the elves from Morgoth. So they attack Morgoth and he doesn't really fight, <coughs> fight in person at first. He sends out his armies and so his armies, and they are defeated eventually. And he tries to fight him, but is captured and is uh, taken to Valinor and sits there in captivity for a long time. And that time, the Valar invite the elves into the west. The elves go over, at least some of them. And basically, it's like paradise. It's basically a perfect, peaceful existence there for everybody. But eventually, uh, Morgoth is uh, set free because he pretends to be reformed and pretends he wants to right all the wrongs he did and the Vela basically or Manvir decides that they have to give him a chance but Morgoth secretly basically never <clears throat> never even considered uh, denouncing evil so he pretends to be a good guy corrupts the elves that live in Valinor until some of them basically almost openly rebel against Valinor, among them Feanor, the creator of the Silmarils. Then they discovered that Morgoth is really just secretly riding up the Noldor. The Valar can't catch him, he destroys the two trees, takes the Silmarils from Feanor that he really desires because they're so beautiful, and flees to Middle-earth and basically begins ruling it there again. Where, as we learned before, Sauron basically uh, yeah, did some <clears throat> did some housekeeping while he was while Morgoth was away. Feanor and some other Noldor follow him to get the Silmarils back and get revenge on him, and basically besiege him in Angban together with the allies. But Morgoth eventually breaks out and starts conquering northwestern Middle Earth. <clears throat> but it's uh, really, his armies conquer Middle-earth. He mostly sits in his fortress and only fights 
fights once to kill the king of the Noldor, which ends up uh, he gets ends up getting wounded himself, and then a bit later, Baron Luthien, the original man elf couple, steal one of his <coughs> steal one of his Silmarils when they sneak into Angband, his fortress, and then when he's basically almost defeated all his enemies. Arendel, father of Elrond, sails into the west and convinces the Valar to help Middle-earth. Then the army of Valinor comes over, defeats Morgoth in a 40-year war that ends up sinking the whole continent. And Morgoth doesn't really even fight himself at all, he just begs for mercy at the end and is then bound by a chain and cast out of the world. And that's basically where his story ends. And so the the arguments for Morgoth, that's like two arguments. The first one is, well, he's the after God who is by definition the most powerful being in the universe. He's, Morgoth is the second mightiest, mightier than his brother, and designed to be that way. And well, he's also, I think, in terms of like antagonists, villains, is the most influential being because he basically created the <clears throat> basically was the original the original antagonist without him or well, in his time there really weren't any other great disputes like he is the whole reason there even was any con other any conflict at all the i know were all singing together <clears throat> in harmony except for him he started the whole yeah like started in his whole another faction basically without him everybody would have been united. He later corrupted the men shortly after they first came into the world. He <coughs> broke the peace between the elves and elves and the Valar in the West. So uh, of all he's really has a lot of influence, of course, mostly limited to the first age. But even beyond that his influence was pretty <coughs> pretty big because uh, yeah early on in Tolkien's stories um, Morgoth was more like kind of like the evil, just the evil ruler, like that that held feasts and created orcs with uh, some dark sorcery. But later on, he became more complicated. Like Tolkien thought about his goals and basically concluded that Melkor's goal was complete control, complete domination over the whole world, without the ability of anything to even oppose him. Like. Not just beings who he ruled, but beings that, that were physically unable to oppose him. And to achieve that, when he noticed the other Ainur don't follow him, the men and elves have their wills of their own. He tried to put his power into the world itself, to basically try and make the whole planet part of himself. But in the end, he overexerted himself. He basically, basically created evil in that way. So, yeah, this, there's a comparison to Sauron that Tolkien made. Like, Sauron concentrated his power into the One Ring, but for Morgoth, the whole world is his ring. So, he really basically created evil, and all the evil that happens even after he was tossed out of the world is part of him. And he has in he definitely is uh, more simple than Sauron in the end because he just wants to destroy and everything that he can't control because as it turned out he can't really fully control anything but like he's more of a the whole philosophical concept of evil is basically condensed into his character so yeah that would be my argument mm -hmm, indeed and I think the um main thing that I thought I think would be a good comparison between um, Sauron and um, Morgoth is that even though Lexi did say that the duration that um, Sauron had a bigger part to play through maybe throughout the entirety of the Legendarium but from the start where even when the singing of the Ainu and when the world was created Sauron when Sauron did mar that song and the effects of that can be seen all the way into it because it was basically evil was um it was dealt and di driven into the world and the nature and everything due to Morgoth and him singing against it and then that and the effects and consequences of that had made sure evil would always be in order and middle earth as well so yeah really interesting points there as well 
but now we've got our final character and that is Mandos and we have the ever willing Imzo Bud going out for it so let's take it away when you're ready Imzo Bud okay cool. well let's start with the lower part Mandos is one of the Valar the spirits described by Lexi earlier the he is with, because with the exception of Melkor, all the Valar are, are good. He is subservient to Manwe, the Elder King, and uh, serves him as judge and prophet. He delivers doom, judgment, but he also is a, uh, but he also delivers prophecies of sorts. But he is also responsible for housing the spirits of the dead, the dead elves, and guiding those of men towards their fate, the fate that remains now. So. From an external point of view, the evolution of the character of Mandos, with the exception of a weird phase where he was known as the Wind, the dude did, didn't change a lot. He remains an ambivalent character, and morally, um, he is not morally grey, as he ultimately serves uh, Luvator and so is good, but he is at best neutral towards the elves. A testimony of this is the fact that in Elvish, Mandos is derived from the Elvish root for Hell. Where, and it is cognate with Angband, which means which literally means Iron Hells. So we can see that he is not very much appreciated. As a character, the few times we see him in, he he appears as grim, uncaring, inflexible, and with a unique sen sense of humor, as as was the case, for example, in the Silmarillion twice. First time when Fean when Feanor uh, declares that he will be the first one slain Naman, and Mandos replies, "Not the first," referring to the death of his father, a father that Feanor lo loves a lot. The second time is when Earendil sets foot in Naman. Earendil is a man who comes from the from Beleriand at the end of the First Age to plead the case of elves and uh, asks the Valar to help them, and he he very. Peacefully, he the guy isn't very isn't uh, isn't troubled by it. He asks, "Shall a mortal man set foot in a, in a man and uh, and live?" Even though he was the one who he used Arendil as an argument to justify the remarriage of Finwy, but we'll get to that later. His history, he's like the other the other Valar. He participates in the Indale, He descends into Arda. He fights in the wars against Melkor. He retreats to Valinor, and uh, there he he pronounces the statute of Mir of Miriel and Finwe, which authorizes Finwe, the king of the Noldor elves, to remarry. Then he delivers the doom that bears his name, the doom of Mandos, by which he curses the Noldor elves who who slayed their kin, the Chellery elves, and stole their bullets. Uh, a prophecy that uh, very much uh, coats the entirety of the First Age and dictates how it how it will happen. So. The people who know who Mandos is probably are raising their eyebrows and are skeptical. But Mand Mandos is a, is a good valor, so he is evidently a good character. But I'm not arguing from the perspective of uh, religious good. There is the uh, side in with what uh, with Iluvator. Uh, like Melkor is evil, apart from ruining things and killing people, he is evil because he disobeys Iluvator. Mandos obeys him. But from a certain perspective, Mandos can seem like a villain. Which perspective, you might ask? And another, and another people would uh, raise an objection. They would say, if you are going to use Mandos, just go with Manwe, because Manwe also does has ba bad decisions that backfires on him and leads to all catastrophes and calamities. But Manwe, Manwe takes bad decisions, but he has good intentions behind them. He doesn't really, he doesn't, for example, welcome elves into Aman in order to. Uh, he doesn't welcome them into Aman to to kill them, or he isn't planning for the, the exile or for the first age to happen and all the bad events in it. No, nor does he plans for the destruction of Numenor, where he when he grants them the when he grants men the island. He just believes in the good faith of be in the good uh, nature of people like Gandalf, and is ultimately faithful in Eru Luvatar and his belief that he will come to save the day should evil prevail. Mandos, on the other hand, doesn't have this excuse. Mandos is omniscient, or at least as close to omniscience as you can get. He knows what will happen. So when he's doing something or not doing something, 
He is consciously participating into the creation of the history of Middle Earth as we know it. There is a series of atrocious calamities from the creation of orcs, that hideous life form, to the extermination of elves, the destruction of men, the sunken of Beleriain. All of this Mandos has a hand in because he didn't speak or he, or he spoke in a certain manner. And uh, this he does it either by lack of insistence, such as was the case when the Valar were debating whether or not to welcome the elves in Aman, where he did not insist to keep them in Middle-earth and to fight Morgoth and root him out forever, or by silence when he doesn't say that when he doesn't say that Melkor is fa is simply feigning to be to be good and he's still evil. That that happens when the Valar liberates him after his three ages of captivity. And uh, he say that he repented and now he wants to be good, etc. Or, in some cases, for by what can be described as indifference towards the lives of elves, men and wolves, or pure malice, as is the case during the remarriage of Finwë and Miriel uh, and uh, Indus. So, to make a long story short, Finwë, the king of the Noldo, marries Miriel. They have their son, their first son, Fëanor, but Muriel dies. Finwë is sad. He meets he meets Indis, uh, another another elf lady, and he falls in love with her. And he just starts a campaign to obtain the right to remarry Indis. And the Valar have a large debate. They discuss this, and there are there are proponents of both sides. Those who wants the who wants Finwë to remarry. In this, and those who think he should uh, just uh, calm down and wait until his first wife, wife come back, comes back from Mandos. And Mandos is the one who gets the, the last word. He is the one who delivers the doom. And in his doom, he basically argues that, yes, that no, he doesn't argue that. He argues that uh, the, the marriage of Finwë and Indis will give the will give birth to great uh, all the elf, elven lords and leads to great deeds and uh, it will enhance the glory of the tale of arda as he says and in this he doesn't care about all the bad things that will happen with this glow with this uh, enhancing glory of the tale and he doesn't do it because he forgets about it he knows about it but as he says himself the griefs that shall come from this remarriage, you shall weigh in the balance, and they shall not seem too heavy compared with the rising of the light when Valinor groweth dim. That is, when Era Earing er comes back, he says that the Valar will weigh all the suffering and destruction that happened, and they will see that just that just this uh, these good, good tales, the Silmarillion as we know it, is worth it. And that's not. Uh, from for my uh, at least for me that's not the good way to approach it he, he doesn't give a damn about the lives of elves or if thousands die or if families are broken etc he doesn't care he, for him the, all that matters the objective good that all should strive towards is the glory of the tale of arda and that is not the way a god or a, an, an omniscient god like mandos should behave he he approaches things from an authorial perspective. He sees the high deeds, he sees the great tales, he sees the suspense. He he sees like an author. He he wants characters to live great great stories, and for him, tragedies are good tales. They aren't tragedies. He doesn't see death. He doesn't see sorrow. He just sees good tales, and that's uh, well, as I said, that's that makes him from the perspective of men and elves a, a villain. Because for them, he he purposely created this history. He planned this. He knew that Melko would would betray them. He knew that the trees would fall. He knew that the Kinslaying would happen. He knew he knew that uh, Fingolfin would die. That the Elven kingdoms would would be ruined. He knew of everything, but he let it happen nonetheless because he believed that it would lead him to a good story in the end. And for me, that's that's why, as an omniscient being. And as a sort of mastermind towards uh, towards the whole of history of Arda, the guy is the most influential villain in the in the history of Arda. And that is very very interesting. And I know I'm um, coming off it, maybe from a lot of people watching, might not straight away go to Mandos, but I think um, you've clearly given like an overview of why that could be the case and his personal intrigue for certain things, which makes him this um, potential villain as well but 
it looks like is now up to you guys i will leave a poll at the end of course you might go and um, straight away but maybe think about it from this after watching this who do you think that in the biggest impact is um have any of these characters that have been um explained in today's video will be the main and most important thing that they've done is impact middle earth and our day in this way so i'll leave that poll in the description below and if you want to go and vote from there you can and we will look at it next week and before we do wrap up um of course at the end we got some if um at the start we know for lexi she might want to give some um counterpoints especially maybe to florian and what he said about um Morgoth etc as I believe Lexi was debating on the side of Sauron so take it away Lexi um so I did just want to offer this as maybe a complicating factor to your argument um as I pointed out earlier if we were talking about uh you know who's the most powerful villain or who's the first villain Morgoth takes it away of course the argument's a little bit more nuanced than that it's who's the most impactful antagonist um so one of your uh, points, I believe, was that Morgoth was, he's the originator of evil, basically, without his decision to kind of go his own way, even before the history of the world begins. We we really wouldn't have evil, um, and that he basically corrupts this perfect paradise that the Valar have created for themselves. Um, so I, I have one point against that, and his name is Aule. Uh, Aule is um, the Vala that Sauron served originally, and uh, the other thing about Ally that's pretty nifty is that he's the creator of dwarves. Now, he was not supposed to be trying to create life, that's, or at least not sentient life, that's something that's uh, Eru's domain, as it were. Um, but he, he also has this moment of rebellion, where he creates something that he's not supposed to create. Um, and of course he repents, and Eru says, you know, it's okay, I'll allow, you know, basically I'll take what you've done and I'll work it into my plan. But he does say that there's always going to be strife be between elves and dwarves because of Aule's. I guess uh, disobedience seems like a strong term, but his his doing not quite what he was supposed to do. Um, and there's other examples of this as well. We know that uh, Yavanna, the you know goddess of plant matter and of the earth and of you know life giving bounty, she kind of gets upset about this. Um, and this is how, this is where Ents come from. She argues that, well, if, if Aule gets to create his own stuff, then I should get to create my own stuff, and I need someone to protect my trees. Um, so Manwe basically lets her go get away with that. Uh, so what I'm getting at with all of this is that, you know, Morgoth is not the only one to introduce uh, sort of variants to the the plan that Eru has laid out. Um, so if, if Morgoth hadn't rebelled, I think someone else would have. I think maybe even Sauron would have eventually. Um, yeah. I guess that's that's kind of my. It's not a not a knockout punch, but it is. I think it complicates our understanding of Morgoth as being this. You know, oh, if only Morgoth hadn't existed, everything would have been fine. It's like it, it wasn't fine. People were were doing all kinds of crazy stuff. Yeah, that's that's a fair point. I think it's basically comes <laughs> goes a bit back to what I'm so said about like what. What really is evil? Like, do we just follow the Eru's view or the, the view that basically the, the texts describe, like, okay, Morgoth is evil and the other guys, like, there's there's some conflict, of course, not the, <clears throat> there's some conflict when Morgoth is, like, the only evil one, or do we say, okay, there's, like, even without Morgoth, there would have been other conflicts? It's hard to say how the world would have gone without Morgoth's interference in the music and with Sauron, of course. Yeah, it's, it's fair to say that Morgoth, of course, uh, first seduced him to evil, but still, like, it might may be possible that even in a world without Morgoth, there would have been some conflicts, and of course, like, on the, <clears throat> I think the, the thing with uh, Sauron is that, of course, he's the most uh, impactful villain in our world, because because a lot of the Rings was, is of course, by far the most most famous world of, work of Tolkien, and so Sauron really it had a lot of influence in, in the Tolkien fandom and pop culture. So it's like it's easy to basically well, he's the most the most popular, the most well known character. So in our world he had the most influence, but I think if you if you agree that like the 
the evil the evil that Morgoth put into the world and what he created not is basically counts as his doing because it's his power and his agency that caused it then he's definitely the most uh, impactful mm. most impactful antagonist or even villain of the series even if you as I'm so said maybe you want to argue a bit about the morality and who's who's evil who's good or like how how do you define that but I think in the popular understanding that we use Morgoth really is the the prime mover of evil so to say indeed yeah. it, you go on I just it's really hard to argue ultimately against you know Morgoth tainting the nature of physical reality itself and warping the flow of time so it's yeah. it's a very hard to argue against that Not compellingly that's anyway that's why I wanted to bring in the whole point about like I mean if, if you really want to go f further with it maybe you can say like of course Tolkien is writing a fictional history for our world and now nobody remembers Sauron or Melkor until Tolkien translated those texts so in the canon like Sauron's influence like you know he's he's influencing Arda today because millions of people have read the books with him and seen movies about him so he's yeah. more he's famous that is quite an <laughs> interesting take on the question as well because at the end it's in Tolkien's works and Tolkien's legendarium so I'm sure that could be extended as well but I think even though of course the, um and maybe the main arts people might go to is Morgoth. I think recent, well, still, well, not me, you guys um, did a really good job in um, maybe showing the other, um, maybe maybe other ways. I think um, Lexi as well maybe said tone down the impact of um, Morgoth as well. But for episode one, that's about it. I think we've had a really good go at it indeed. Um, so as well and of course don't forget mandos like um i'm so has put forward as well so i will leave um i will leave a poll for this and you can vote of course i know maybe take away the predispositioned opinions and based on this what you think um who do you think maybe after this has the most impactful nature on um in tolkien's works but that's about it now so first of all thank you i'm zo you're welcome thank you thank you for inviting me here for inviting me as always no problem also thank you florian oh thanks glad to be here no problem and it, if that's your first time as well so i'm yeah, really good for that and also as always thank you lexi yeah, thank you so much had a good time indeed and hopefully we'll be back next week for another one another debate but in the end thank you guys for watching i really appreciate it please like and subscribe but until the next video my friends goodbye